Hello, and welcome to Sound and Image Lab, the Dolby Institute podcast. This is a show about how artists use technology to tell their story, and I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. We're continuing our coverage today of the 2021 Emmy Awards uh, with a show that has a, a lot of nominations this year. WandaVision has a whopping 23 Emmy Award nominations this year, including outstanding limited or anthology series, uh, outstanding sound mixing and outstanding sound editing. And we have a pretty amazing panel today on to discuss the sound work on this uh, really fun, challenging show. We have Danielle Dupree, who is the re-recording mixer and the dialogue editor. Uh, I wanna check my notes here because uh, this, this group has a lot of accolades and I wanna make sure I get all this right. Uh, Danielle is a previous Emmy winner for her work on Star Wars, The Clone Wars. Uh, she's joined by Kim Fiscato, who's the supervising sound editor on the show. Kim has a previous Emmy win uh, for her work on Philip Kaufman's movie, Hemingway and Gellhorn. We're also joined by sound designer Steve Orlando and by supervising sound editor and dialogue supervisor Gwendolyn Yates Whittle, who goes by Gwen. Uh, Gwen is a two-time Oscar nominee for her work on Avatar and Tron. Uh, and if you've been listening to the show for a long time, she was uh, our guest in the very first season talking about the, the art and the craft of dialogue editorial. So if you haven't heard that in-depth conversation, I encourage you to go back and check that out. WandaVision is a, um, this is a really fun show. It plays with, you know, genre and time and it's, uh, it starts off very simply and then builds to, I think, a, a, a typical kind of Marvel Universe climax with a lot going on, big action sequences and really tremendous sound work. So there's a lot to, uh, to discuss and to talk about on this show, so let's dive into it. Well, uh, Gwen, Kim, Steve, Danielle, thank you all for joining us today on the Dolby Institute podcast to talk about WandaVision. Um, I've been looking forward to this conversation because I really, really enjoyed this show. And congratulations to all of you on your well-deserved Emmy nominations uh, for this show. I, there's so much to talk about in in WandaVision. Um, I, I, obviously, you know, one of the first things that I think is uh, is pretty obvious to discuss is is this kind of the the trope of the the the, the sitcoms as you go through the years. Um, what a it's, it's a pretty amazing gift to give uh, to you guys on the sound team. Uh, to, you know, obviously start with, uh, you know, it starts a, a, in a black and white 1950s kind of treatment, sort of a Dick Van Dyke thing. And then we move through uh, the uh, the decades as the show progresses. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, Gwen and Kim? You guys were sort of the, the, the first ones uh, in as supervisors on the show. Uh, what did you think when you read the scripts for this and thought, uh, oh my gosh, what, this is going to provide some interesting opportunities for sound treatment? Can I tell you something? Honestly, I never read a script because, <laughs> because the because because the lovely pandemic changed everything. I was supposed to be on a different Marvel show, but they hadn't shot enough when the pandemic hit. But WandaVision had, so they said, "Here, do WandaVision." So I I I said, "Okay, sure," and I just started watching. I was completely charmed by it, but it had nothing to do with any anticipation because I was like, "Oh." changing tax. So, um, but yeah, but the whole, that whole first episode with Dick Van Dyke and then on to the bewitched part of stuff. It's just, I, I just, I love the whole thing. And the, the writing in it is so awesome. Just that we've been like, you know, the Cracker Jack idea and all that kind of stuff is, you know, Catherine Hahn and then the, just the way they all evolve with the whole, they evolve along with the television. So with all the way that it comes evolve and it's just, I just love it. I still, it's very dear to my heart, this whole series. So it's, it's really amazing. Tell me a little bit about, so obviously the, the challenge for you all was to, was to kind of try to recreate the sound of those classic, you know, television shows as well. So tell me, did, uh, you know, what was your process to kind of research? What did the Dick Van Dyke and Bewitched and Full House and Modern Family? Yes. I think we all went back and we watched them all. We all did. I mean, Danielle did, and Steve did, and Kim Newby went, and we said we realized that Dick Van Dyke and Bewitched, there was no foley. Everybody floats. It's all just about the words and, and sort of the little musical things in the laugh track. And the laugh tracks, we found out morph as well. But we went, it was actually 
really interesting to go back and to watch those shows listening to them as opposed to just kind of sitting back and and kind of, you know, chuckling along with them because they are, it's a really different style of television than we're used to now. All of them. When we, um, when Steve and I first started talking about this and after I had, I was able to sit down and watch all the episodes, we had a really exciting conversation because, you know, all of us combined, we've worked on a fair amount of Marvel features and it's just we were steve and i had a conversation where we were just so excited to have the opportunity to make it sound a little bit different than what we would automatically think the direction that marvel goes um so that like i I remember watching it like maybe a month out before the mix and it just sparked my excitement so much and yeah i went back and i binged um dick van dyke and mary tyler moore and brady bunch and then um, we started kind of mapping out how things were going to sound and, and how they were going to change throughout the the series. One thing that um, I did was we got old masters from um, we downloaded old masters for these um, for these TV shows and separated them out, dialogue, music, and sound effects, and ran them like you know a big chunk, like maybe an hour or so of content through spectral analyzers, so we can kind of see have like a physical representation of or visual representation of the frequencies that each were sitting in, you know? So we had that type of information going in um, as to kind of give us a better idea of what was being captured back then at each stage of, of Hollywood television. Um, and really did change drastically over the, you know, 15 years, 20 years that we covered, everything sounded much, much, much different. But with that type of research and with that information, it really gave us a good idea of how to match into that era, era um, and, and try and get it. Yeah, I'm curious about what you learned, because obviously, you know, you guys weren't even alive when those TV shows were, were <laughs> well, originally. Well, some of us were men, but course. yeah, but most uh, most of you were not. So what did you learn about about kind of artistically, creatively, aesthetically? How did how did the how did TV audio evolve? Gwen said there was no Foley, but uh, obviously I, I think there's, there was very little sound effects too in most of those early shows, right? So how did how did the aesthetic evolve over time? Just a lot more detail. And that was something that was, you know, e- relatively easy to and exciting to flesh out as the, as the episodes went on. So you started in the, you know, 50s, early 60s and, and the recordings that you're listening to, you know, they don't have, they don't have lab microphones. It's really only one or, or a handful of ambient mics placed around the placed around the set. And then you also have the laugh track um, or you have the live studio audience providing the laugh track live. So especially for the earlier episodes, everything, and, and we try and try to mix this obviously um, to replicate that, everything was really stacked on top of each other. Um, we, we made the first two episodes mono um, everything just kind of all the sounds collapsed into the basically same source section, same source direction. Also, this was all filmed on, you know, a, on a recording stage and which had like a lot of live room to it. So we really worked hard to kind of recreate that big sound stage, film stage room that was automatically on on everybody's microphone well, or just like the three microphones that were used. Um, we also did a lot of ambience matching. So I would take those old masters um, and find like good, just clean air ambience, kind of like what the audio equivalent of a film grain would be. And we laid that in as like a, um, a bed to put everything on. So you kind of got that old feel, that old noise um, that wasn't really present in, in our new recordings because everything was done so cleanly and um, precisely. So it really was a kind of a matter of smushing everything together and messing it all up. And, you know, fully, if we did have fully, it really had to sound like production. Any sound effects really had to be EQ'd and put in the room. So it didn't sound like, you know, it sounded like poorly recorded. <laughs> production sound. Um, they were doing a lot the best of, they could given the technology at the time, right? They were. And honestly, it sounds, a lot of it sounds really good. Another thing we really experimenting, experimented with was warming stuff up. Um, a lot of like crunchy lower end, warmer distortion on stuff um, really helped. We had um, we had the idea of futzing every episode through the, you know, the era's television set. And we had, um, Steve and I kind of put our heads together and came up with different prototypes for those futzes, but um, our our brilliant director, Matt, kind of moved away from that idea because it felt like it was pushing the audience away, you know, watching it through a TV, through a TV, 
Whereas you really needed to be in that surreal moment um, with them. I see. So what you're saying is sort of like, because I, I remember having this conversation with Ren Kleiss about Mank and, you know, they replayed the film and re-recorded it and that became a layer. So you tried that, but you actually found in this case, it didn't work because we're supposed to be in the sitcom with them. Right. Yeah, exactly. It was, it was a very cool, it was a cool vibe and it was fun to listen to and very nostalgic, but, um, they were so interested in, in capturing as much of the, of, um, Lizzie and Paul's and, um, Catherine's, um, performances as possible and, and kind of putting it in this kind of rolled off distant space was a, a you know, a bit counter counterproductive to that end. Wanda, hmm. is there something special about today? Well, I know the apron is a bit much, dear, but I am doing my best to blend in. No, no, there on the calendar, someone's drawn a little hard right above today's date. Oh, yes, the heart. Hmm. <laughs> well, don't tell me you have forgotten, Viz. Forgotten? Oh, Wanda, I'm incapable of forgetfulness. I remember everything. That's not an exaggeration. In fact, I'm incapable of exaggeration. Well, then tell me what's so important about today's date. So then it just became a, you know, a lot about what sound effects choices we're using, what type of um, kind of ambient bed we have in there, how we can recreate the sound of a, of a soundstage and, um, and, and make it really feel like everybody is in the same room at the same time. Yeah. Well, and I, I presume, you know, much as we found out when we talked to Ren about Mank, you can't just like set it and forget it. You have to, you have to, to come in and dodge and burn and really kind of fine tune it because it's, it's uh, yeah. Absolutely. And every episode change, you know, so you would dial in what you thought would be good for this episode. And then you'd have to, you ha you'd have to change it per, per voice and per performance. Um, and then once you kind of felt like you had a handle on it, it went gone, you know, it went away. And then you're 10 years in the future with new technology that you're trying to mimic. And, uh, but Ren, we did talk to Ren quite a bit um, actually, Right before we started, Kim had just come off of working on with Ren on Mank, and she was like, "Oh, you know, you should talk to Ren about the patina pass that he did." And um, we, you know, our starting points were kind of around the same same idea of splitting it out and and frequency analyzing things. But he had a lot of really good ideas that I was very grateful for. <laughs> yeah, part of the fun of the piece is that um, you know you have that patina the, the the treatment to make it sound like the classic sitcoms but this is all happening kind of because of wanda's power to distort reality and make this but reality intrudes usually at least once an episode there'll be something that kind of pokes through and these really interesting moments happen um like i'm thinking episode two when you know uh, when when the the voices come through the radio or even in episode one with the uh, you know the boss who chokes and then Steve, I presume that that's kind of when you came, you came in, right? So you get these moments where it becomes a much more high fidelity, you know, when reality kind of intrudes on this, on this uh, situation. Can you talk about those moments when you kind of got to, to poke through there? Yeah. Um, the director was, you know, it was obvious, but the director was very clear about these are the moments where we're, we're no longer in the TV and we're like stepping away from, from the show and, <clears throat> and reality's just slightly breaking, especially in those early episodes. Um, so the first one was super fun. Uh, the tw it was, you know, the director said Twilight Zone esque when they're sitting at the table. So that was the first time. <clears throat> also in that episode, mix wise, where we started to pull stuff out in stereo and surround, and and uh, <clears throat> it was an interesting transition to go from, especially in that first episode, uh, almost no sound effects. Most of the magical sound effects in the first. All of the all of the so magical sound effects in the first episode were score actually, um, and then um, so that was the first time with big sound design stuff that was kind of surreal and and but at the same time trying to transition out of almost nothing into uh, kind of a weird uh, still kind of old TV reference of the Twilight Zone stuff. Um, <clears throat> and then, yeah, it, it, as it goes through, reality breaks and it becomes more and more um, about just actual sounds and being in the <clears throat> outside of the TV show and into reality. Hey, Steve, I, if I'm remembering correctly, there's also parts of, you know, the stuff that foreshadowed future episodes. It was like the clock and then they're, you know, the ads kind of thing. So it was all, I remember that was part of it. But yeah, it, the right? ads. Yeah, somewhat the ads that the ads like and uh, the um, clock in the um, 
uh, dinner scene again uh, foreshadowed other events where there was these there was uh, it foreshadowed the clicking watch in the um, Strucker commercial and I used the same click from there and then that rhythm was the same rhythm for the heartbeat when um, when they're waking up in the hospital and I don't remember the episode number but <clears throat> after the after the blip reverse blip um that's the same pattern for the heartbeat yeah that was a recurring theme that that uh sense of time passing essentially and also about also about to explode so you're you're heading yeah, your also yeah are... same same clock again about to explode for the the um same rhythm again for the bomb that's exploding when um wanda's waiting uh at her house as a child so yeah reoccurring themes there and I know a lot of this stuff got picked up. You had a very, um, I, I think you had a you had a very closely following fan base on this show. Uh, I know the there was a lot of stuff on Reddit about WandaVision and a lot of a lot of conversation about about sound and the and the sound design and effects that would show up. What was it like to have a community obsessively following this show as it as it as it came along? That must have been fun for you. Yeah, that was just from just a simple sound uh, design uh, concept. It was really interesting to look on Reddit and see that someone I snuck like a Tony Stark um, repulsor fire up into the um, Stark commercial in the first episode in the toaster. I didn't think anyone would, in the toaster. I didn't think anyone would notice, um, and uh, I don't even know. I, I didn't tell. I didn't tell you know Danielle or anything like that. That's the thing. Just like you know, left it in there and it was low. Uh, and uh yeah it was really weird to see that like people are like oh that's the sound from the repulsor and that and that that's the sound from his suit moving and stuff so yeah they 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 noticed everything yeah well it, it helps that you guys were uh were obsessively focused on that and not just grabbing stuff from willy-nilly and putting it in because they would have focused they would have picked that that up as well right yeah i mean that's one of the the awesome things about uh working on these marvel shows is there's kind of a a uh, giant library of things to pull from that, you know, I mean, Iron Man, you know, 10 years ago, CB, you know, kind of set the groundwork for all this to be built on and Shannon and Nia have, you know, continued on with just making all these awesome sounds for these shows. And, you know, we get to access uh, a lot of that stuff to use for this. I mean, Wanda, without all of the magic and stuff that Nia had created over the years of her being in the movies, you know, would have been a much harder task. <laughs> so, well, Kim and Gwen, I'm curious to hear from you. I mean, uh, you, you co-supervised this uh, show, and I know that you're that you you're both dialogue folks. Uh, so I'm kind of curious about how, um, how you guys work together. And I think, you know, it's, it's interesting that especially those early episodes, mono, very heavily dialogue driven, not a lot of necessarily sound effects, but that, that also cuts both ways. Cause there's really nothing for you to hide behind either. Right. Um, that's a, that's a pretty critical, uh, listening environment. So tell us about, uh, vo the voice treatments and, and the di and the, uh, and, and the dialogue editing and, and how you two work together. I, I was kind of on first and Kim came on for the actually much more complicated and difficult episodes at the end. So that um, that was that worked out well for me. But, you know, I have to say the location recordist who did a a really, really beautiful job. So there was not a ton of ADR. I don't I mean, not really. I mean, a lot of the ADR was um, added group stuff. Um, so as far as editing the production, it was, yeah, it was actually a real pleasure to edit. And I think Danielle can say that, you know, the, the hardest part of the mixing was not the dialogue. It was, you know, just making sure that the, you know, the various effects things worked. Uh, and it was about keeping it warm and round and, 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 and real. And uh, so it was actually a pleasure to do that stuff because there wasn't a lot of crap to, to take out or to, there were not, there were not a lot of problem scenes, especially in the earlier ones when stuff got into more of the, the Marvel universe where they start using fans and sort of, it becomes more visual effects heavy, but that you had to do more, more ADR stuff. But at the beginning there was maybe a couple of rainy scenes, but that was also in the Marvel universe part of it. So um, maybe it was a little bit more forgiving, 
but no, it, it was it was a joy. And then Kim and uh, Matt Wood did uh, a lot of the ADR stuff, a lot of the loop group, like for the witches and stuff at the end and a variety of, well, Kim can talk about that. It's funny that you mentioned that there wasn't a lot of loop group at the beginning because it didn't really occur to me, but I guess there wasn't. It was the latter scenes. And, you know, of course, we're in the middle of a pandemic. So it was a very interesting um, process getting it all done. You know, um, Scott, uh, Skywalker and a couple other studios, Disney, have built these remote kits for all these actors. So, you know, Paul Bettany was up in Upper State, New York. Lizzie was in London. And people are kind of around the world. And so we had to send out these um, packs to... You know, and they'd, we, they'd send them a computer and they'd send them a you know, mic stand and mics and they could remotely log into the computer and the actors would set it up in their house. And then Loop Group was a funny one, too, because uh, Matt Wood had um, everybody source connect in. So they're all recording in their houses, in their closets or wherever they could. And then we would get individual tracks for all these Loop Group um, sessions that he would just pull into Pro Tools. And um, the the witch sequences were relatively large, and so were the latter episodes where we had a lot of loop group. And because all the loop group is on individual tracks, it got really, really wide in some spots. Like where Danielle would look at these tracks, going, "Oh my goodness," you know, for for things like the witches and stuff, um, because we wanted to kind of give it this kind of bigger group feel and usually when you do loop group you know you'll have 10 12 people in one room so you'll maybe do an lcr and you'll have a couple of lcr tracks and in this case we had 15 individual tracks plus multiple takes and layers so you're looking at sometimes 35 40 tracks of loop group and stuff sorry i went on a rant on no it's really it's really interesting it's kind of like good news bad news right the you know the pandemic actually created this entirely different workflow that netted out you had a tremendous amount of control that you've never had before right but you also have a lot more material to deal with yeah it is true like you could because as a dialogue editor there's occasionally a couple of loop group people that always seem to stick out. So now you actually have control over those people. You can pull them down in the mix so they're at the same level as everybody else, which, you know, in a group situation, you don't get that opportunity. And you're kind of like, and so you'll hear from the mixers, like, that one person, they're, ah! <laughs> so you're trying to, you know, kind of mitigate that. But this scenario, because they're all individual, made it a lot easier. But it is a lot more material to wrangle. And... Um, you know, the actors, Paul Bettany and Elizabeth Olsen, they were so lovely to work with. And, you know, the actors were all very easy to work with and totally uh, not complaining about anything. I mean, this is completely out of their realm. You know, they get this package, they have to set it all up and, you know, and, and but they were all very, very gracious. And so I appreciate They had to put that. on their own mics and everything. It was just like- yeah, because usually, usually, usually we don't we don't trust actors to do any of that stuff on their own, right? <laughs> it's true. I know. It's very true. Yeah. I mean, the other thing is that um, we had a laugh track expert because the quality of the laugh tracks changed over the decades too. So he knew what the laugh track would sound like. Uh, for the for the first episode, we we did have the onset crowd for mo- for most of it but then the other episodes it was wasn't shot live so we had to recreate all that laugh track and that so most of the loop group stuff was for that and it's just kind of fascinating that the quality of the laughs changed and, and at a certain point the music took over for the laugh tracks and it, it stopped you know i can't was that malcolm in the middle i can't quite remember which one it was because uh, that way then music music took over but it was actually fascinating that that quality changed as well in addition to that like when i first got on Gwen's first thing to me, because like I came on late, they all had started earlier and then took a little hiatus. And then I came on because everything had pushed and Gwen was going to start another show. So they brought me on as well. And the first thing she said, it's like, they're really, really particular about the laugh track. Like it has to be like, they had already done a couple of recordings with the loop group and it was like, nope, nope, that's not working. And so that's when I think you guys got the loop group expert, but it was like a specific type of laugh and treatment to the laugh track in those first beginning episodes, which I thought was like, okay, that's interesting. Well, I definitely like remember watching MASH as a kid and I, I would start to recognize specific laughs, you know, it would show up. <laughs> the laugh loop. Yes. Well, there's that guy again. 
I do think overall, though, something that everybody, ourselves and the picture editors and everybody took away was it's really hard to make sitcoms work now. It's, you know, not if you want to get a laugh and you want it to play, rhythm is really important and rhythm and timing and just, just the overall feel, especially when you're cutting in these labs, you know, like they can't go on too long. They have to be full enough, but they can't be overpowering. And there's so many small things that you, you look at a sitcom and you, from far, from afar and you think like, Oh, it's pretty easy. It's pretty formulaic joke, 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 set up joke. But it's really wasn't like that. It was really hard to make them play smoothly and play well. And, and, you know, to hit, hit the points that they want to hit, especially, like you were saying, when the modern audience are not necessarily, I mean, everybody loves sitcoms, but it's not what we're so used to anymore. And they, and our sensibilities have evolved from back then, you know, so. It, I think, yeah. I also think the hardest thing was an uncomfortable laugh when they, they're supposed to, I mean, there are a couple times where we needed the audience to feel uncomfortable and those were hard to, those were harder cells. Yeah. I'm thinking because specifically like, like about so the, long. I'm thinking specifically about the magic show, um, which, you know, is kind of light and funny, but then it's also could, it could fly off the rails at any moment. Right. So that's, that's a very specific kind of mood that you have to go for. Yeah. And a couple of times when you can see vision figuring things out where it's like, it's funny, but something's not quite right. It was a lot of, um, holding back, you know, especially the first few episodes of, of holding back and knowing when to knowing when to create tension, knowing when to hint at something else happening. It was a lot of, you know, it's Marvel. You want to hit the ground running and just, just flesh everything out. But it really was a slow burn and figuring out, you know, keep pulling things back, keep pulling things back, make room for that tension, make room for that confusion while also trying to move things forward and, and keep things um, engaging and, and feeling full, you know, and finished while also being accurate to the time. Um, a lot, lot to consider there. What was that? <laughs> Honda? Yes, dear? Are you using your powers to turn on the light? Yes, dear. Allow me, sweetheart. What do you see? Only your lovely rose bushes. That's all? Are you using your night vision vision? I assure you, my love, I see nothing amiss. You have absolutely no reason to be- oh, No! <laughs> you were saying? Well, I wanted to ask you about um, kind of that size and, and scope. And, and you talked, Danielle, about keeping a slow burn. I mean, you know, Obviously, this is the this is the first of the Marvel you know TV shows that's that's coming out on the on the streaming platforms and and I know that that this is kind of entering into a new phase four of of the of the MCU. Um, you know, it it's a TV show, but it's got to have that size and scope of what we've come to expect from the Marvel universe. And certainly, you, you know, Danielle, you called it a slow burn and it starts off very intimate and small scale, but then about by episode four, when we're outside of, of the town and we see the base camp and like, this is a full on Marvel, huge epic scale. Um, and obviously, you know, Gwen, Kim, you guys have all worked on very, very, very big movies. Gwen, you've worked on some of the biggest movies that have, have, have ever been made. What was the challenge for you guys about trying to achieve that scale of vision? Uh, on, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that these were more generous than a typical TV episodic scale and, and budget, but it, I'm sure it wasn't as big as the Marvel movies, for sure. I have to say before Danielle talks about her, her thing. The thing that was very frustrating to me is because, you know, I know I know what it's like to to be in a mix with the big movie. And she kept saying, "We can't do that. We have to contain it. We have to contain it. We have to contain it. We've got this limiter. We can't go." I was like, "Oh God!" Because you over the whole episode, you can only go so loud because it's on TV. So that's something that I had to wrap my head around as well. I mean, she obviously did it really well, and she and Steve, you know, at the end, yeah, they've got like. 3,000 kinds of magic going and, and lightning and thunder and, and, and flying around. And they stayed within their limit. Somehow, magically, they were able to do that. But Danielle can explain how she pulled that off. 
It's amazing that I made it through that that quandary without losing all of my hair. I definitely lost some of it, but <laughs> it is hard. It is really, really hard to take something that is so big and so active and pare it down and also have it play as something that's big and full and active. Um, you're right. This was, this was the first time that they've done this and, you know, television, you know, broad, broadcast and streaming, you know, streaming in particular is relatively new, but it's been around for a while. And, and you have had action shows that have been, have streamed and have, you know, done, done well on smaller scale TV sets. Um, but this was the first time we tried to take the Marvel chaos and put it into a little handheld device, basically. Um, it was really hard. It was really hard, particularly because you have, um, all of a sudden you have loudness specs now that tell you that your dynamic range can go, f you know, from a theatrical where it's here to now you really got to keep everything here. It's all got to play kind of at the same level. So people aren't turning their TVs up and down, but it also has to feel dynamic because that's how the movies feel. Um, so, the, and also it's particularly hard because these, these, boring technical specs that we're absolutely tied to their um, averages over time. So in movies, when you have, you know, a two hour movie and, and three reels of talking and two, a two reels of craziness, that's a little bit easier. But when you have 30 minutes <laughs> of content, 17 of which is just chaos, then it's really hard to be able to get that to work. Um, so kind of a big thing that I started doing, um, which is, you know, definitely a different approach than theatricals. I started, um, especially when it came to effects and music passes, I started with the biggest area first. Um, and I kind of put that into, um, I, I mixed that to like where I felt it could be as far as I could push it. And then I would have an idea of how to work backwards from there because you're no longer in a situation like you are with theatrical where you can continue to push into something to make it bigger and fuller. You know, you reach a point where you can't turn anything up anymore. Otherwise this is just not going to, not going to work. So you have to flip that a little bit and just start taking things out, you know, get to a point where you have to be as full as you can and, and get that to where it needs to be. And then everything else in just kind of by like a, like a theory of relativity and like scale. Um, if you pull that down, it's, it's, it's going to sound a lot smaller, you know, by comparison. So it's not necessarily, you know, loudness is always a relative thing. Um, but relative to what usually in theatrical it's relative to the room that you're listening in but for streaming it kind of has to be relative to the other content in the episode um that took a really long time <laughs> that took a really long time to to master um because you know you also have um we're, we're working with directors who know that they're making marvel movies um and they're listening on big dub stages and um, you can't present them with something a little puny that, you know, is and, and, and say, well, you know, we have to do it this way because that's the, the, what the Disney loudness spec is. You, you can't do that either, you know. So you have to kind of feed a bunch of different mouths at once um, with that. It's a really, really hard balance. Tell me about, uh, Danielle, you know, what, what your mixing environment was. Were you in one of the, the pod rooms at Skywalker there? Uh, and were you... And, were you there for the entire time? I remember when we talked with Bonnie Wilde about the Mandalorian, she was like, she was camped out there for months. She was sound designing and mixing in the same room. And it kind of like the various pieces of the process kind of blended together. Was it the same with you guys? Absolutely. I think they locked, locked the door and threw away the key for me. She never, she, she, she never, she never got to leave the room ever. <laughs> Well, it was also different. Um, so yes, I mixed this in, a, in our smaller um, pod rooms just because that, the, that scale of room is a lot closer to a near field environment, which, you know, is really what you want. Um, also compacted by the fact that we were in a pandemic. Um, so, and we were very aware of, you know, with the tight schedule, with the tight budget and with the amount of pressure on this project, you know, we can't, this, this wild card variable that could take this whole thing to a halt really can't happen. So uh, it was a lot of really long hours. The schedule was pretty intense for about three and a half months. And I just stayed in my room and I went and I worked alone um, with my, with um, Gwen and Kim and Steve on a, on a Google meet, listening in through a third party platform and talking to me via zoom. Um, and I just got here in the morning, worked until late at night, went home, came back and do it again and just tried to remain healthy and not, um, 
not to get sick. <laughs> it was, um, but yeah, it was very, it was solitude for sure. Um, which I think, you know, was definitely harder to foster some of the creative environments that you're used to on a mixed stage, uh, particularly with clients that you haven't worked for um, before. Um, so that took a lot of, you know, trying to spend a little extra time, even though everybody's crunch for time, but trying to spend a little extra time on these virtual hangouts, getting to know people and, and trying to keep it light and trying to keep it fun and being really attentive to if somebody's trying to say something uh, and trying to cut through this big group of, of faces all trying to talk at once, you really have to listen and, and try and make it. I, I felt like I had, to, I had to do a lot to make it a um, kind of um, open environment for trying something and then, you know, or not. Yeah. Yeah. It's different. <laughs> so Steve, were you, uh, were you at the ranch or were you sound designing from home and kind of what's your, what's your setup? Um, I was mostly at home at the beginning. I would go in for playbacks, but then as the pandemic moved on, uh, things got a little more strict at the ranch. Um, and also one of the more interesting things about <clears throat> staying at home is it, it kind of allowed me to hear what the director was hearing because it was, it was nice to hear stuff in the pod, but the director is at home, you know, listening on a pair of headphones that we sent him. Um, and I started listening to playbacks on those headphones because we were getting notes and we would sit there and be like, what? <laughs> I spent a lot of time, especially on, I mean, on all episodes, but especially at the beginning, flipping between native Atmos to 5.1 to stereo. Um, from my mains to my near field speakers to my sound bar um, to try and understand how things translate in a way that I haven't really thought about that before. Um, and it was like, like Steve was saying, we would get notes where I was just like, I can't understand how we could possibly make this any bigger. <laughs> uh, but then you listen to it, um, you listen to it on smaller speakers or on sound bar and you realize like, all of the low end that you really um, rely on in theatrical to make things sound full and big and earth shaking, it doesn't exist. You know, TV, TV speakers are rolling that off and you can't rely on your subwoofer. You can't rely on um, just making things louder. Um, so also Steve started having his, um, I think himself and also his edit crews, they started cutting sound effects on small TV speakers um, so that they had a better idea of what's going to punch through and what's going to sound huge. Um, in in the, that limited bandwidth and that limited frequency range. So, so you were so you were mixing natively in in what seven point one point four, um, which which is the home Atmos spec. But you were also because your creative partners were all listening on headphones. You had to make sure that it was all translating down to a, a two track and still cutting through, and you could still maintain the dialogue and all that. Absolutely, and but not only creative partners, most of the world, you know, I think after WandaVision came out, we got, we finally got the specs. We, we went in knowing, we went in knowing that unlike every other Marvel thing, the two track really is what matters here. <laughs> um, but we got the numbers after WandaVision um, premiered. And I think over about 80% of people were, were listening to the stereo. And so it's a complete reverse of what you're used to with theatrical, which is, you know, mix it wide and big and huge, and then worry about the two track later, you know, Stereo is never, it's not, you know, it's not as sexy saying it that way, but if you want to do a good job, you have to think about how people are going to hear this. And there's so many variables to how people are going to hear this. Um, so the big focus for us was if you can make it, if you can give it movement, if you can give it depth and fullness in the two track on smaller speakers, then that really is what you need to be focusing on. And then everything else will just kind of fall into place as you, as you um, open up right. your listening environment. Well, because it's not just Steve's amazing sound design, but you also have a very, very full score from Christoph Beck to work in there as well, right? And there's a lot of music in this show. A lot of music. Incredible score. I, I, I loved, I was so thrilled to be able to work with it, but it's just, you know, it felt a lot, uh, a lot of the time, like trying to cram a camel through like the eye of a needle, you know, <laughs> there's so much going on in this soundtrack, especially in the later episodes. Um but you have to keep it defined and you have to, you know, it can't, you know, how you mix so many colors together, it turns brown, you know, you want to be able right. to see the colors and know what's going on and have definition to it um, and, and depth. Yeah. Well, Steve, you, uh, I, I want to give you a little chance. Uh, you had mentioned uh, the, uh, the, the repulsor and the toaster oven. I'm, I'm curious, I would love to hear just a couple more of your favorites sort of, you, you guys have a lot of fun with Easter eggs in this show and putting, 
putting little delightful things for the Marvel fans to uh, to clue into. What are what are a couple of, the, of your favorite Easter egg Easter eggs from a sound design perspective that you were able to work in? I've been working on these Marvel movies. I started off as an assistant for Shannon Mills on Thor two. So that's when I started on the Marvel train, if you will. Um, so I, uh, I, I've kind of seen them all uh, many, many times. So whenever possible, I would dig up, um, little bits of stuff. So, um, especially the commercials were the main point. I would always try to find something from that movie to put in something. The, the, the biggest ones were Iron Man repulsor and his joint movements for the toaster. And there was a lot of opportunity to pull up all those old um, sounds from the past movies and tweak them and make them work for the the flashbacks and that kind of stuff to repurpose <clears throat> the original like staff sounds for when Wanda. Well, it's really a, it's really an extraordinary show. I think one of the things that that I was not really prepared for was how <clears throat> was how emotional it got. Um, you know, and especially those first few episodes. It's a pretty straightforward. You know, it's it's kind of a it's a it's it's a it's a it's a really fun romp, but then it really becomes a show about loss and mourning, um, and it's really emotionally powerful. And you guys did a fantastic job at kind of navigating that, that taking the audience on that journey. So um, just fantastic work! Congratulations to all of you. Thanks. It was definitely a group effort. It was not one person all by themselves, except for Matt Shackman, of course. But. Um, <laughs> No, it was, it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was really emotional. You know, my favorite line is still, what is, what is, uh, grief, but love persevering. I mean, it's just, it's just beautiful. Right. Yeah. Right. That's great writing, isn't it? Yeah. That's it's what, just beautiful writing. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, I know we're out of time, so I really want to thank all of you, Gwen, Danielle, Steve, Kim. Um, it's been great talking to you about the show. Congratulations uh, again on your incredibly well-deserved Emmy nominations. I know it was uh, it was tough to make all this fit in the the time and the budget, and and obviously, Danielle, the spectrum that you were allowed uh, from an audio perspective. So, yeah, really fantastic. Congratulations to everyone again. Thanks for having us. Nice to see you all. Thanks again to Danielle, Kim, Gwen, and Steve for joining us today to talk about the work on WandaVision. And thanks also to our friends over at Lucasfilm and Disney for helping put this conversation together. If you haven't watched WandaVision yet, I highly recommend you do so. It is streaming on Disney Plus and Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos. You can find links in our show notes or you can find the entire first season on the Disney Plus app. And if you haven't already, please make sure you're subscribed to us, the Dolby Institute podcast. We have a ton of exciting episodes coming up the next few weeks that you won't want to miss, including the continuation of our 2021 Emmys coverage. You can find links to our dedicated podcast feed in the show notes or by searching for Dolby wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, please leave a rating or a review on the Apple Podcasts app. It really helps raise awareness of our show and helps us continue to grow. Until then, thanks for joining us. This has been Sound and Image Lab, the Dolby Institute podcast. I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Our producer and editor is Michael Coleman. Our executive producers are Amanda Schneider and Jack Ferry, with production support by Taylor Hines. Thanks for listening. <laughs>